afternoon, everyone. So, welcome to your new lecture of Lompiad. So, before we actually begin the lecture, we will be talking about Fermat's Star Theorem. Now, obviously, it was given by Fermat, and uh, he was a French mathematician. Uh, actually, he was trained to be a judge, not a mathematician. He used to pursue mathematics as a hobby. Yeah. So, one of the greatest mathematicians used to pursue mathematics as a hobby. I don't know whether it's more ironic or more funny. I don't know. So, yeah. He was a French mathematician and what he used to do was, when he used to get free from work, in the evening, he used to read about mathematics and he used to do mathematics. So, one day, uh, he came home and he was reading this book, Arithmetic of by we have talked about uh, the mathematician. This is by Guy Francis. Yes, I don't know the pronunciation. I don't know the pronunciation of this as well. So please don't take me on that. So he was chilling out in the evening and he was reading Arithmetica by Guy Francis. So in this book, he encountered the Pythagoras theorem, with which we are very well acquainted. Right? We all know Pythagoras theorem. So basically, he was reading about the solutions of this equation. Yes, over the collection of natural numbers. So can you guess the solution of this equation over the set of natural numbers? I think we all can. In fact, the solutions will be Pythagorean triplets. As in 3, 4, 5, 10, 6, 8, and 10. They are infinite. You can write as many as you like. So, he was reading about this. So, he started thinking, he's like, I'll just change up the equation a bit. I'll just tweak it a bit. So, instead of this equation, he started thinking about this equation. x cube plus y cube equal to z cube. Like, square say tweak here, right? Yeah, this square. So, you have cube for here. He was like, how much difference will it make? I'll see. So, he was looking at the solution of this equation. And obviously, he must have used methods, hit and trial and what not in order to find the solution of this equation. And he realized that there is no solution to this equation. There is no solution of this equation over the collection of natural numbers. And here, solution is infinite. And what is the change here? Now, here is the solution. There is no solution. Infinitely no solution of it. It is like, uh, I'll think about x raised power 4 plus y raised power 4 equal to z raised power 4. I think about this equation. Again, he was perplexed. There is no equation. There is no solution for this equation as well. No solution. It is like, it's funny, Melra, it's funny, Melra. Then, he thought about this equation. x raised power n plus y raised n equal to z raised by n. He was like, I will try to find the solution of this equation over the collection of natural numbers. Obviously, we are talking about just the collection of natural numbers. So, must have done this one. In fact, this is the theorem basically. That x raised by n plus y raised by n equal to z raised by n has no solution has no solution over the collection of over the collection of natural numbers or n greater than 2 because n of 2 or jaga obviously kya banega here and there we know that there are infinite number of solutions of this equation so, this is the Fermat's last theorem that this equation has no solution for n greater than 2. Now, sadly, he did not write the proof of it because he was taking notes in that book and he was like, the margin is too small. So, obviously, I can't write the proof. I know, if only the margins were a bit wider, we would have gotten the proof of this result a while back, pretty much earlier. Right? So, and 
sadly after he wrote this he died so obviously we never got to know about his too but uh, the other mathematicians they came across this result and this result seems so simple and it seems true so like let's prove it and they tried it and then they when they tried proving this they were like oh my god we can't prove this they were unable to do so they were like what is happening here the mathematicians like oilo he also tried to prove this but he was unable to do so and mind this this uh, result was written in 1639 all right after that after that many mathematicians tried to prove it but they were unable to do so but finally in 1994 1994 a mathematician named andrew weil was able to prove it so 1639 1994 and then finally the proof of this theorem was formally written down so actually the story about the mathematician andrew weil is the reason why we are talking about thomas graph theorem because his life story his story behind actually proving this theorem is intriguing it's very intriguing. So let's talk about his story rather than common that you can read online. So let's talk about Andy Wiles now. You will be like, "Mom, why all of a sudden are we talking about like is this some sort of extremism or something?" No, we are mathematicians, right? Or aspiring mathematicians. I think we should learn about the life of the greatest mathematicians. We should know how they thought about how they lived. So let's talk about Andrew Wiles. Now Andrew Wiles was ten years of age. Ten years of age when he first encountered this problem, this theorem. Ten years. He he was in library. Yeah, we don't do that now. In order to issue a book, so he came across this book called uh, The Last Problem by E. C. Bell, and uh, Fermat's last theorem was mentioned, and it was also written. Uh, this result has not been proven till now. And then he was angry. Why? So he was like, this statement x raised by n plus y raised by n equal to z raised by n has no solution over the set of natural numbers for n greater than two. This statement, this theorem is so simple. Even a ten-year-old boy can understand this. What this theorem means or wants to convey. So simple. So concise. So elegant, but then still there is no proof. It just perplexed him so much, and this thing was there in his mind throughout his life. This hankering in his brain. Like, okay, this theorem is unproven. This theorem is unproven. I can prove it. I want to prove it because look at these statements. Look at the Thomas last theorem. It seems so simple. Yet it is so difficult to prove, and uh, this was there in his mind throughout his uh, career. He went to school, he went to uni, he pursued his PhD. But somewhere down the line, somewhere at the back of his mind, this theorem was there. The line was there that this theorem is not proven till now. That line from the E. P. Bell book was there in his mind, and. that maybe i think that made him more motivated about things more motivated about proving this result that nobody has proven this till now i think that's a pretty good impression right so when he was at princeton he encountered this theorem again in his life and he was like now i have equipped myself with good education now i know my Now I know the technique. I know the method. Now I think I'm well enough. Like I think I'm better than uh, 10 years old Andrew was. I'm better equipped now, so I can take a shot at this problem now. So he decided to take a shot at this. And what he did was he went into self isolation. The term that we are very much, uh, we pretty much hate these days, isolation. 
but he went into self isolation for uh, okay let I, i won't tell you the number of years but uh, let me ask you what's the maximum time that you have devoted to a program maximum time it might be a school problem or on your problem or uh, any problem in puzzle book anything it might not be a math problem it might be a physics chemistry or maybe a life or uh, lots of problems maybe you know why does the world exist and stuff like that what's the maximum time that you have devoted to a problem maximum i would say for myself it was one day and i was like i give up i'm done one day that was the maximum right पाना में थक जाते हैं यूजली हम मैथ कर रहे होते हैं वाना लगा दिए तो निकल लेना डोंट वरी वी गिव अप वी लुक एट द सॉल्यूशन ऑनलाइन और विल आस्क द टीचर वी गिव अप हमने मार्क कौन लगा राइट दिस इज अ यूजुअल रिस्पांस बट एंड योर वाइल्ड वेंट इनटू आइसोलेशन फॉर सेवन इयर्स सेवन इयर्स ही लिव ही ब्रीथ दिस प्रॉब्लम फॉर सेवन इयर्स कैन यू इमेजिन डूइंग दैट Persevering for proving a single result for seven years, I think that's pretty incredible. That's the sort of determination, that's the sort of dedication that we should have, or maybe we should at least aspire towards. Yes, he was a genius. Obviously, we can't have all that that he has, but at least we can aspire. Now, two things that we have to learn from his life. First, the importance of perseverance he was at the problem for 7 years he also had to start doing that i'm not saying that solve a problem for 7 years i'm not obviously saying that all i'm saying is if you get a problem persevere at it give time to the question instead of looking for some shortcut or some new method or something like that no give time to the problem devise your own method devise your own shortcut students many students ask me for shortcut for a test for a school test or some random exam or something that frustrates me so much why do you want to know the shortcut learn the method you can devise your own shortcut why do you want to know my shortcut it would be pretty much outdated devise your own devise a new novel shortcut for it come on milega kaise by learning the method by learning the technique by learning the logic shortcut logic se hi aata hai and you people ignore it so first thing that we learn is we should learn from his life is perseverance second thing i think one of the most important things that we all should uh, pay heed to is the importance of education why see he was 10 years of age of this He knew that he can't. He must have been like, yes, I can solve it. But let's be realistic about it. Ten years of age, proving from a stress theorem, a bit difficult. So what he did was he went to school. He went to university. He did his PhD. He got himself a good education. That's what he did. Why? So that he can equip himself with methods, with techniques, with knowledge. In order to tackle the humongous task of solving or proving Fermat's last theorem, that is the importance of education. Education lets you; it teaches you how to think. It doesn't teach you that you know think this, yeah, think in this manner. This is the shortcut. No. At the ideally, education should teach you how to think, so that you can think new method yourself. Why do you want to learn the outdated method? Why not devise a new technique? Why not devise a new branch of mathematics? So that is the importance of good education. That's the second thing that we should pay heed to from Andrew Wiles' life. First, first perseverance. Second is the importance of good education, which is just to learn how to think. And that is what I want to talk about. Because in this rat race, we sometimes forget why we are studying. We are not studying to get marks. Trust me, honestly, I'll I'll be very clear. I don't care about your marks. I don't care whether you you get full marks in school or not. It frustrates me when people are like, "Ma'am, I want to get good marks in school. Is that the aim of our life to get marks? No. Our aim 
aim in our life is to get good education, and that's the end of it. I don't want to hear, uh, "Mom, yes, my marks failed, therefore admission bullshit." You want to have excellence in your life rather than marks. Marks will get you to a point in your life, but excellence will get you through the end of it. All right, so that is something for you to think about. I hope it makes you wonder. It makes you ponder about things. All right, so let's begin the lecture now. Right? So yeah, let's begin the lecture.